Hey, what's up, everybody? I am your host, Rob Younts, and thank you for tuning back into the Canecast Show. If today is your first episode, man, you're in for a treat. If you've been with us before, we really appreciate you coming back. Either way, today's guest is another Virginia Tech Hokie alum, but he mashes in the MLB. Before we get into that, I'd like to ask a favor of you. Please help us grow this show. First of all, just smash the like button, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on your favorite podcast host. Give us a like, please. Two, drop us a comment to let us know what you like about the show or don't like. That's okay. Three, help us grow our community by subscribing. This lets others know that this show is legit. Four, show us some love with a review. Five, share it. Send this to all of your friends and even some of your enemies who are missing baseball right now. Today, we are talking with a guy who will play anywhere just to make it into the lineup. As a matter of fact, he's played seven different positions in his major league career with the Oakland A's. He was on Coach Jeff Petty's original Canes team while he was playing up as a freshman and sophomore. He was a 160-pound college freshman and grew into being an all-ACC performer. Hard work and overcoming doubt has propelled him into a major league ball player. To Chad, it's all about the relationships, so it's no wonder he's a fan favorite. Let's listen in on Chad Pender talking about how versatility keeps him on the field. This is a power-packed episode, so let's get to Chad right now. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Rob Younts uh, with Canecast. As always, we have Jeff Petty with us, um, and we have a really cool guest today. It's a guy that I've known for quite a while and probably longer than he even remembers um, because I ran into him on a Virginia Wesleyan baseball field with Coach Nick Booth. Uh, his dad was out there, and, you know, it's been great to follow his career. He was a uh, as, as most of our guys are that we're interviewing, uh, that, that's a Canes alumni um, or alumnus. Um, he went to Virginia Tech, was a was a really really good player there, and now he's a really really good player in the uh, in the bigs for the Oakland A's. Chad Pender, man, how's it going this morning? Man, everything's great, healthy, happy, all's good, man. Thanks for yeah. having me. Hey man, love love uh, love that we can get you on. And how about you, Jeff? How's things going uh, in Fredericksburg? Good man. It's the weekend. All right. Hey, man, it well, doesn't hey, really matter. It's the same day. Does it feel? <laughs> yeah. It's just the heat, man. It feels like a Monday. It feels like a Thursday. <laughs> right. It's Good Friday and Sunday is Easter. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So, so Chad, tell everybody, I guess, bring everybody up to speed, kind of on your baseball journey, where you started, where you grew up, uh, and kind of bring everybody up to speed where you are today. Yeah, I um, started playing baseball young and all throughout Virginia. Um, ended up settling down in Pocosin um, for my high school ball and travel ball, stuff like that. And, you know, linking up with the Canes when I was, what, 14, 15? Um, mm -hmm. I guess going into freshman year or right around freshman year. And I think you were in eighth grade, yeah. Yeah, I think I was in eighth grade when we went down to uh, your brother, Mars. Your brother got in a little bit too before you. Yeah, yeah. I think you remember that. Um, played high school ball, coasted high, played with the Canes for four or five years. Um, ended up getting a scholarship to Virginia Tech and going there for three years and um, was lucky enough to get drafted by the A's. Um, 2013 and then uh, was in their minor league system through 2013, 14, 15, and 16 uh, and then made my debut in the big leagues in 2016. Uh, 2017 did not make the team out of camp, uh, went to AAA again and then eventually got called up a week or so into the season and ended up staying and I've uh, been with the A's since that time. Yeah and, and you're a fan favorite there right? and you know, we'll touch on that. I know, you know, you have, uh, if you follow um, or you do searches for you on social media, you have a ton of people that, that, that love you as a player. And, and it's easy for us to see why. Jeff, you know, what, what did you see in, in Chad when he, was, when he was younger and playing in the Kings organization? Um, well, I mean, when we, we had him when he was young. And I, there's actually pictures out there that's resurfaced of him being really small. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, even when he was small, he, he could just really play the game at a high level. The fundamentals were there, you know, obviously, as a hitter, as a 
defender. And, you know, I think he would even say this. He'd probably he'd throw a lot of love to his dad. Yeah. I mean, those guys, that family is just a baseball family. And you know, his, the dad has so much to offer. He's such a great guy. And so, I mean, just a great player as he, at a young age. And then, obviously, as he filled out and got stronger and stuff, you know, he, more physical, he got better and better. Um, but, yeah, what I remember is just such a fundamentally good baseball player at right, 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 right from the jump. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how he's known around here. You know, Pocosin, for those of you that don't know, Pocosin is in the, uh, the 757 area of Virginia. Um, really small community, very tight knit. Chad, tell me a little bit about growing up there and, and touch on your family, because I think it's, I think it's pretty important. And I know you're very, very close to them. Uh, and, and, and they've been in t- uh, an integral part of, of your growth as a, as a player and as a, as a person, obviously. Yeah, you know, I guess I'll start with Pocosin and then end with the, the good stuff, the family. Uh, Pocosin, I mean, it's a small town, um, you know, no more than 12,000 people in it. Uh, Friday night football, that's the big thing. Wrestling's a big sport. Um, and then right around the time, I'm not saying baseball hasn't always been a big sport there, but I'd say right around the time I was in seventh, eighth grade, there was a few guys that transferred over. I mean, we had Kyle Crockett come over, Chad Funkhauser. Uh, the Hills, um, you know, we had a lot of guys move into Pocosin um, um, for school and stuff and then ended up having a really good baseball team. And uh, I would say from the time I got into high school, my freshman year through when Chase left, um, some really good baseball teams there. Um, How many state championships? Um, we had two. Um Chase and them made it to, I think they made it to the finals and lost, or semifinals and lost. Right. His senior year. Were you back-to-back state titles? Yeah, we were back-to-back oh, state, state champions. Um, like, I mean, the, the last two years I was at, the first year, like, we, we battled for that state championship. It was, we went, we battled. Like, it, there were some close games. We ended up going 28-1, and one, but that That's was closer. Bad. The next year we went 28-1 and one as well, but. That team we had my senior year, we were very good. You know, we, when you got Crockett going out there every other day, you know, you're going to put yourself in a good position. And we had some guys that could hit. And um, So, yeah, I mean, Pocosin's a fun town, too, because there are – it is so close-knit. There's so It's a small amount of people. Um, they really rally around you. Whatever sport is in season, um, it's packed out. Football, basketball, baseball. I can remember when we won the state championship. You know, we got escorted in with the police and firefighters, and there was a ton of people at the high school waiting for us to get there. It was really cool. Um, and then now as far as family, you know, with, with baseball and, and everything like that, we're obviously a sports-oriented family, but we're a very, like, close-knit family. Um, you know, siblings, parents, like, every, we're just a – we're very, very close-knit. Um, and obviously – Tons of sports, as many as you can think of, football, basketball, baseball, softball. You know, little sister's playing softball in college now. And Chase went to Clemson, um, is now with the Cardinals organization. Um, Clark could have played. He could have hit anywhere. Uh, he had an opportunity at Radford, decided to, to not do that, ended up at BCU and getting his degree there. And he's in Chicago now. And um, a lot of um, – a lot of hard work, though, in the family to get to where we are, and I think that's a testament to our parents. Um, not only the help they've given us to give us the opportunity to get to where we are, but um, them instilling that 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 um, that hard work in us and that work ethic for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a that's how I know you know your your whole family. Dad's a great guy. Uh, I still keep in touch with him. Love his his tweets. And, oh man, and he's all over it. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> I get I get a random text. I love, from him I love when he middle. starts attacking the airlines. You know, no airline is safe, man. But <laughs> he's speaking for the masses, man. He's he's speaking for everybody. But and, right. and I, I love all of them because they're all true. It is. Exactly it's, right. They're all so true. Yeah, yeah, and he's, you know, you, you're both your parents are very competitive. Both both of them are great people. Um, so. You get to well, let me ask you this: What well, you had a lot of success in high school? Uh, you had a lot of success with the Canes. What did it mean playing for the Canes? I mean, what was what was that about? I mean, looking you know looking back on it now, you're one of the pillars. You're one of the original founders that built that foundation. Um, you know, for for where we are today. You know, what does that mean to you? What does that 
How does I mean, that it's awesome. I mean, it's an honor. And, and you say, you know, where you are today, but, you know, I know you guys won championship after championship, but even then we were that good. You know, we had that talent, you know, and which is even more surprising because it was localized. It was Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, some Maryland. Um, you know, you guys went out and found the best of the best in that area and put together some very, very good teams. And then once you start winning and start doing that, and then that attracts other people who want to play and, you know, wear those colors and wear the Canes jersey. Um, you know, it's cool. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And uh, so t let's let's reverse this a little bit. What was it like playing for Jeff? <laughs> Jeff was oh, awesome, I man. We had a great time. Um, you know, at that time, Jeff was still young. You know, couldn't have been 26, 27. Right? Early, early on, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, looking Very back, that's how that. old I am now. And I can imagine having 20 – 17 year old actual rugrats little little turds running around thinking they know everything like i can i actually i talked to rob on the phone yesterday and i'm like hey i'm doing this interview with petty like do you remember that one time where we played a consolation game in myrtle beach and we lost because everyone was just out of it and petty's lighting us up in the outfield and all and you start laughing and I can't stop laughing. And I'm like, imagine if someone did that to us right now, like some little 17 year old that thought they knew everything. Um, but you know, we had a great time, you know, he always kept it loose. Um, some of my fondest memories and some of my closest friends to this day come from the Canes. You know, I'm, I got three guys from the Canes that were in my wedding. Um, and I would never have met them without the Canes. So, um, I wouldn't be where I'm at without the Canes. Um, so for that, I'm extremely grateful to the Petty family. And, you know, we always had a great time. And we still have a great relationship to this day. And, um, you know, it's definitely a family atmosphere. And that, that, that's the truth. And we're looking 10 years back, even further than that, 14 years back. And, and that's still the case. So That's really cool. You know, and, and I, I like asking those questions because like, I want – you know, I want Jeff to know because I, I think that, you know, I know all you guys feel that from, you know, you know, especially from that beginning and, and going through all of that together. But I also want, you know, that's something we talk to our current players about now, about being a family and, and where that's going to, you know, where that's going to lead because they're going to get connected um, and then they're going to face each other in college and, you know, yeah. the, the guys on the other teams may not, you know, may not understand it. But, you know, guys that have been through our organization, you know, hope they really feel that because I feel that's an important part. It's not just baseball. You know, you have, heck, you have several, you know, guys that are, you know, working their way through, you know, the, the athletics organization now, you know, that you're running into spring, at spring training. Well, you were running into it at spring training and on big league fields that, mm -hmm. you know, you played with or played against. I mean, the, the level of baseball back then, as it is now, is really, really high. So, you know, it's cool to see those relationships and, and, and how they still flourish, uh, you know, like you said, 15 years later. Yeah. Um, you know, I you mean, know, to talk about yeah. that a little bit, you, you have all these guys come through and are you really close with all of them? No. No. I mean, it, like Chad, it's, it's a special bond. And I, I go back to his mom and his dad. They're just relationship people. And then Chad is like that. So I just – Chad's like a friend. You know, I don't even remember. I mean, I remember those days. I do. I had a lot of growing up to do, rough around the edges. I, I wish, you know, I could have coached him in the way that it is now. But all that happened for a reason or whatever. But he's just a relationship person, Chad is. I mean, he, he has all these friends. He's very likable. Um, you know, and that's something to be taken away from that is, if you are like these high school kids now, if they're open to, for to be more than just this coach player or pencil you in, you know, relationship, yeah. it's definitely there to be had. It is a family atmosphere if you want to partake. Yeah, it, it, I mean, and the kids that don't fit in, you know, the kids that end up leaving us are really transactional. What can you do for me? You know, not really buying into 
the whole team concept to development. It's just what can you do for me right Those now? Those guys don't do real well in our system. They don't last with us. No, they don't. And well, and I, I, go ahead, Chad. Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I, I would imagine, you know, me starting with you from such a young age, you know, I was with you at 14 years old, you know, you being 26, 27 at that time, still learning and still really getting your foundation as a coach, as a manager. Um, I'm still trying to find my way as that young kid, trying to like get to the level where I'm going to be, find out what type of baseball player I am. You know, you grow together as a coach, as a player. Oh, and man. there is a, a bond that like you're, you're figuring things out at the same time. Yeah. Whereas yeah. opposed to like right now you have your bearings and you know who you are as a manager, you know what you got to do on a daily basis. You have your schedule set out, you know what you're doing. And you know, some of these kids don't like, we have that bond because we were going through something at the same time. Oh man, for sure. No. Yeah. That's, and then even now, I mean, we don't spend that, you know, time together now. Like yeah, that. No, when we do but, it but it's now, like, oh, it's awesome. It's like we pick right back up, but even now where we both kind of know where we are, I mean, heck, maybe one day we'll coach together. Who knows? 10, 12 yeah, I love years. That. Old. You yeah, got right. that little boy coming through. I know. Right. Yeah. 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 We'll yeah, so tell, tell us a little bit about that. Tell us, tell us how, uh, tell us a little bit about your immediate family, your wife, and, and things like that. Yeah, so um, we're about a year and a half in into our marriage. Um, we got a little one on the way. We got a little boy on the way. Uh, she's she's twenty weeks pregnant right now. Um, so September third is the due date. Um, You're gonna be playing ball. I hope so. <laughs> I <laughs> hope so. <laughs> Touche. Yeah, right. Um, but, you know, when it, when it happens, you know, I'll get right back here to Charlotte as soon as possible and, and be here for the birth. But, yeah, no, we're, we're super excited. We weren't – we weren't – we were surprised, to say the least, but we're, we're very excited. It's awesome. awesome. Yeah, think about that. So think, that? About, think about playing with Jeff back then and now where you are. You know, think about all the growth that you've gone through you know, as a player and as a person, you know, I mean, and, wow. and you've known Jeff that long. And I, and, and I think that's, you know, that, I think that's really, really cool. And, it, and it's special because there's not a lot of that happening. Um, you know, we've, my experience is, is I see it all the time in our organization. Um, you know, those great relationships that, that continue to go on. Um, you know, talk to us a little bit. So, so that's your Canes experience, which sounds like it was great. You guys won, and and we, did. we won a lot. You know, right? We, we had a very, very close knit group. Like I'm talking about, really tight. And like we still talk. We mean, yeah. yeah but Rob, Rob was Rob's Chet. Rob's highly competitive. The, highly competitive too. But oh, they weren't just. Huge. They weren't just close. I mean, they yeah, wanted to right. win too. Right. You know, Rob gave me a hard time because he wasn't called on here to interview. He said something about going on to his uh, reviewing his mediocre career and his <laughs> subpar <laughs> stats. That'd be a guy like you that. gotta have on. Though. We're getting him on. We're we gotta get him on. We're getting him. Not always. A, you're not gonna believe this, but like people are texting us like left and right, like college coaches and different people wanting to get on this thing. It's kind of wild. That's awesome. That's it's awesome. A, it's the start of something cool. Rob's doing a really good job with it. I mean, oh, it, 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 it's as bad it is as the times are now. This is a perfect time to do stuff like this. You're getting out content to people who aren't seeing and getting some live stuff. And you know, this yeah, is a, good a little thing. bit harder to get you if you were playing right now. Right. That's true. Right. That's true. Yeah. Well, and even some of these, you know, we talked to some college coaches and they are, you know, at the end after we shut it off and we're talking like, man, it was so much fun. Can we do this again? Can you guys, you know, put together, you know, a, a chat room or something where we could all get on and talk and exchange stories? And I think there's a lot of that going on now, which is great. Um, That's a good and, idea. Chad, chat room with the old group. Bryn Renner, Rob Mayer. Oh. Hey, Let's Jeff, there's a Zoom account. Make it happen, JK. Jeff. I'll give you the login. You can have the Zoom account. And you, we can that we can, is, we can that line this up. Beautiful. That would, we just need about a half an hour, like a little little happy hour situation. That'd be pretty. <laughs> yeah, funny. that would be funny. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. You can charge admission for that, probably. You 100 percent could. Hi, <laughs> McBroom. Yeah, get them in there. Yeah, oh, right. Roomy, baby. Yeah, so, so yeah, you, you're you're at a point now where you know a lot of your guys that you played with that have continued playing or you know in, in pro ball and things like that. Tell us about your college experience. Tell us um, 
tell us how that was for you and you know how how you lined up at Virginia Tech and and, and how you were able to flourish there yeah I, I think I think Jeff can attest to this I think Virginia Tech was the perfect fit for me at that time um, you know, I wasn't a big kid you know I was 165 pounds my senior year in high school I, I I can play baseball. I'm a baseball player, but I just physically wasn't there yet. Um, so I wasn't a guy that, you know, the big schools were, were all over initially. So, you know, Virginia Tech was, there was just a sense of just being comfortable when I got on campus. And I knew I had Manapply there. I had Morgie there. I had Scoggy there. You know, I knew guys that were going to Virginia Tech. Um, so that had its appeal. Um, you know, being from Virginia, you're either a UVA or Virginia Tech guy. And, you know, I always leaned on the Virginia Tech side. Um, so once I finally got the offer from them, it was kind of game over. I knew I wanted to go there. So got there my freshman year and I had no expectations. I went there. I was, knew I was going to get my degree. I was just going to play some baseball and let the chips fall, you know. Got there on campus my freshman fall and I can remember taking batting practice like on a captain's practice and one of our guys came up to me and was like, you're going to have a great career here. And I'm, I'm just like, I'm just here to play baseball. And um, so didn't start right away my freshman year, ended up working my way into the lineup and, and had some problems with uh, some injuries and ended up playing only probably 100 at bats, but ended up doing pretty well. My sophomore year, I ended up starting at third base every day. Um, went to the Cape, had a pretty good Cape, had to leave and get surgery, and then came back and had a solid junior year. And, um, man, those are – ended up – our team ended up going to a region – hosting a region for the first time. Hosting. Yeah, I mean, we had a we had an extremely talented group of guys there. Um, again, all guys uh, that I'm still close with to this day. You know, it's a special place for me. And I'll, as you see behind me, I got my, my tech jersey, my diploma over there. And um, it's definitely, it's, it's a special place for me. Yeah. It's, and it's interesting that you, you know, we, we had man apply on and, you know, said the same type, you know, same type of things. And um, I coached with Scoggs um, for a year with the Canes. And, uh, you know, he talks about those times. He, it's just you could tell how special it is and how tight knit you guys were, um, and how many good times you had. You know, talk about that lead up to the regional. I mean, you guys you guys end up hosting, and and you know, what kind of baseball was were you guys playing then? What was going yeah. well, and what kind of memories we were, do you have around that? We were playing great baseball. Um, I mean, that whole year we we had a solid team. We had a little bit of a skid where I think in the middle where we were struggling a little bit, but I think we ended up having a really good ACC record. Um, we made it to the AC championship game, um, and that's when we were really, we got really hot. Um, we ended up losing to UNC in the championship game, um, but we did enough to end up hosting, excuse me, hosting a regional, and we got a tough draw. I'm not gonna lie, you know, brought in Oklahoma, they had yeah, Don Gray and yes, they were Ron Overton, who we ended up taking um, the pick before me with the A's. Um, we had Coastal who won their conference. We had uh, UConn who won their conference, and um, you know we just we lost, and that was that was bittersweet because we had a team that uh, we thought we really we could really compete and have a chance to go into Omaha and doing something special. Um, we just fell short, which you know it happens in many teams. It happens too. So yeah, you know what, it, and it's as you see now, it's all about getting hot at the right times and you know, getting those key hits and it's kind of, you know, tying it back to, you know, national championships and championships you won with the Canes and things like that, you know, getting those two strike hits and, and getting hot at the right time, uh, you know, really makes a difference during that time. So leading up to the draft, um, you know, you're taking in the second round. Did you, you know, did you have a feeling you were going to go that high? Um, how, did, how, was, how was the draft experience as an amateur player? Um, again, I, I don't think I had any expectations. I, I knew just from what at the time my advisor was telling me and what certain teams were telling me that it, it was, you know, one through three. But 
you know, I'm like, you know, going back to what Jeff said, I'm lucky enough to have, you know, my dad in my corner, somebody that's been there. Um, you know, I'm realistic. You know, I, I know how the draft works. I knew I could slide anywhere. It could have been the eighth round. You know, it, you never know what the draft is so unpredictable. Um, you know, and I just try to, to not even worry about that, you know. Um, so I had no expectations going in and, and kind of was just waiting to hear back from my advisor and try to keep that day as normal as possible. Um, you know, went fishing and just tried to just chill, you know. If you do yeah. try to harp on it, and it can, it can spin you up. So just try to do normal things. And um, it's funny because I can remember – watching we still watch the draft um again not knowing anything what could happen and i think i can't remember what pick it was but somebody that started with the ch i, I can't remember who i think it might have been chance some i think he, he's, he catches with the orioles now um uh so they announce his name and they're like Shh. and both my grandmas are like <laughs> <laughs> and it flashes like this catcher from I don't even know where. And they're like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, you guys are driving me nuts. Like, let's just watch the draft, enjoy it. And if my name gets called, I'm sure that I'll get a phone call from either the team or my agent or whatever. And, sure. yeah, but, no, it was, it was a cool experience finally getting to hear my name and um, watching my family. And that's how it worked out. I got a phone call from my, from my advisor at the time, and he was saying, hey, would you take this here? I said, absolutely. Sign me up. I'm ready to go. Fly out tomorrow. So they gave me like two picks in advance. So I got to, nobody knew but me. So I went into, the, um, and Jeff knows where, like, where our old sunroom was, where the um, kind of backed into the living room. I sat back there and watched everyone in the living room when my name got called. It was a really cool experience. That's, cool. That's awesome. That is really cool. Jeff, what, uh, did, did you have any knowledge of what was going on with draft with, with Chad during that time? I mean, I know he was at college for, for several years, but I know you hear championship um, and knew I mean, I'm pretty good friends with Neil Abat who drafted Chad and Neil was extremely high on Chad but in high school love camp was kind of popping in on him at the with the Yankees and I was I was working as a, as a bird dog with the Yankees at the time and I'm like I know this I know the size isn't there and all that but if you just watch this kid play he'd be a he'd be a nice pick out of high school and Scott was in on that um, yeah, he was. He was in on it. Like, he did not just go see Chad play once in high school. Like He, he saw me a ton. A lot. And he was trying to talk to the uh, the upper, you know, your cross-checkers. I think a cross-checker popped in. I, I don't think the scouting director just – I think it was the size. I think it was the size. And then the, the pick got kind of too late for you to not not go to college. Yeah. Is that what and, happened? Like, they, were, they would have taken you if y'all would have figured that yeah. out. But you got your dad working for you. You knows the deal. You know. So I can remember Love I can remember, Love Camp came to a ton of games and we ended up having a great relationship. Um, and he straight up told me he said, "Look, like I obviously really love you as a player. I really do, you know, and I love you as a person. So I want to tell you, like, hey, like I, I, yes, do I think you can get drafted and go and figure it out and do it? Yes, but I think that you need to go to college." And he told me, he told me straight up, he's like, I think you need to go to college. I think you need to grow a little bit. And then you're going to look up in three years and you're going to find yourself getting drafted high. He was right. And he was right. And so it was pretty cool, you know, looking back on that and, and having that one guy, I mean, he really was the only scout that really ever stuck around pro scout when I was in high school. And right. like you said, I mean, he, he was always there. Um, and he was yeah. right, you know. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, to answer your question, Rob, I mean, there was that. And so he doesn't go in the draft out of high school. And he he was a slotted first, second rounder. I mean, that's what it was going to be. Yeah. I, mean, I think a yeah. lot of us thought he could have gone in the first round. He had a hell of an ACC tournament his junior year. Yes, he did. Um, I was there, like, the whole tournament. Um, and he just went off in that tournament. They, as he said, they lost in the championship game to UNC. But uh, after that tournament he put together and the season that he had and the Cape the summer before. I mean, high school kids listening, I mean, wasn't taken out of high school, right? And then first, second round or three years later, you know, it's, it's a really cool story. Yeah, and I, I agree 100%. And I think 
you know, one of the things a lot of kids don't understand is that when we're seeing kids, you know, we can figure out if it's a draft kid or it's a college kid. And, you know, we talk about that all the time. And Chad, you know, we, we knew he could play, um, but the body had to get there. And that's what, you know, made him a, a college player. Now, Chad, when you got to Virginia Tech, um, you know, weight room, um, eating habits, what, what changed? What, I mean, I know you grew a little bit, but how'd you, how'd you fill out? What'd you do? I'm gonna, I'll give a little shout out to my college roommate here, uh, Andrew Rash. What, uh, Andrew Rash. what a dude. And <laughs> he, so he was my room and he was always on my case about weight room, eating right. I mean, I'm certainly not this now, but when I lived with Andrew Rash, I was, I was probably like, I probably got up, so I lived with him my sophomore year. I probably gained five to eight pounds my freshman year. So I was probably 170, 175. And then when I lived with him, I jumped another 10 pounds and um, was at like 7% body fat. And I certainly am not holding that right now. Um, but Andrew, man, like, he was just always on my case. And, and, and what's funny is he's the one my freshman year that came up to me and said, you're going to have an unbelievable career here at Virginia Tech. And that he, that's just from him watching me take one round of batting practice. And, um, you know, I thank him a lot for that because he really did take me under his wing and, and make sure I did the right things and made sure I took, you know, took care of business in the weight room and made sure, you know, there wasn't, there was no junk food in our house, man. I mean, which is, it's funny, you know, as a college kid. Yeah, miserable. It, you know, I, again, well, he was Jack too, wasn't he? He was, oh, he was he's well so put together. Jack. Yeah. He's so Jack. Yeah, yeah. Jack. Um, yeah. Again, you know, I, as you know, I still, believe me, I still have my phone and I still, there's plenty of junk, junk and sweets and stuff like that. But, um, you know, that's when I made a big jump. Um, and then by my junior year, um, I was probably another five, five pounds heavier. So I was probably like 190, 195 at the heaviest when I got drafted. Um, and then that, after my first season, um, right after instructs, I got home and really got after it in the weight room and put on another 10, 10 pounds. Um, so at that point I'm 200, 205. And now with age, it's starting to, to add on a little bit with more age. Play around 210. <laughs> with age. Yeah, wait you, I, yeah, but wait till, wait till you get our age and your metabolism slows down. Man. Yeah, well, I'm not looking forward to that. I still got to, like, really get after it. Like, I got to, like, yeah, like, have a professional. Yeah, so I got to, like, yeah. use, yeah. use yeah. this. Right. You'll be mountain bike like, but, uh, when you get our age, you'll be mountain biking like your pops. I just bought a bike. There you go. Yeah. Good for you. you got to milk this thing for all you can, so keep that body right. Absolutely. That's right. You know, wifey, I, wifey, wifey's diving into the late night ice cream and stuff because she's got pregnant. Like uh, I know, and that's that's all laying around for me right now. So I'm like, yeah, hey, don't make us call Rash. Don't no. make us call Rash and get him back in the house. Oh, he would come wear me out. <laughs> uh, so, so you uh, you go you go to pro ball. Um, you know, you, you had a had a really good progression through your minor league career. What are some of the things you took away from your minor league career? Um, okay. You know, I know the power numbers started coming and things like that, but what, are, what did you learn along those stops? Uh, by far, the biggest thing I learned was after my first season. Um, I went, got drafted, was drafted pretty high. Um, they sent me straight to short season, and I'm thinking, you know, this is – it's going to be summer ball. It's going to be, you know, but it was a rude awakening. I was not ready. I was not ready for the road trips. I was not ready for the hotel situation. I was not ready. I mean, everything that you got at Division One baseball, gone, like gone. You're, you're on your own. You're fending for yourself. The conditions are not the best. And I can remember calling my dad halfway through the summer and saying, I do not know if this is for me. Like, I am unhappy. And he's just like, look, just stick it out. This is how everybody feels their first go at it. Like, it's not easy. It's an adjustment. You're going to have to get adjusted. So I stuck it out. My last swing of 
that short season got me to 200. Like I was grinding. Um, ended up going to Instructs, went home for a couple weeks, went to Instructs. And that's when I really bought in that like, this is my job. Like I, I either figure it out or I don't. Like I gotta treat it, treat it so, treat it like a job. Like this is what's gonna provide for me. So that's when I really bought in when the spring training had a good good spring training and then they let me skip uh low a and i went straight to high a and kept going from there um so that would that would be like one of the biggest things that i would tell kids is like if the moment you think it's not for you just give it a little bit of time it's not easy it's hard you're away from your family but if you truly love the game and you know that you can and want to do it for a long time you can you can weather the storm um and then the other thing would be um, find a routine, you know, good baseball players. I mean, good professionals in any, any round, like are routine oriented people. They have a set routine. They know what they need to get done um, and routines. And I, I don't often like to use the word comfortable because being comfortable is not, can be a bad thing. Um, but having a routine can give you a sense of comfort in uncomfortable situations. So I think that when, you know, you're going through a rut or you're not pitching great, um, the simple things, the small things such as um, your, your daily routine in the morning, how you get to the field, how you, what your workload is at the field. If you have a set routine and you know that you can rely on that, you know, finding a routine that works for you, um, you can rely on that sense of comfort when you're uncomfortable or when, when you're struggling, right. if that makes sense. Right. No, that, that totally makes sense. Um, you know, Jeff, we, you know, we're that as amateur coaches, that's what we're striving to get our guys to live. Right. You know, Jeff, I know you, you get your guys doing the same things, you know, your Canes teams do the same things every game. Can you talk about that, about that routine a little bit and, and how yeah, you no. try to help your kids? Sure. I mean, everything, well, things have changed for sure. I think Chad knows that. I mean, we've, I've actually leaned on Chad a little bit. I went to the spring training like three or four years ago and uh, I was in town really to see Chad and a couple other guys. And uh, we were doing dinner one night and he came in and ate din dinner and left because he had to wake up at like four 30 in the morning to meet Wash Ron Washington. Was it, was it Washington? Yeah, Wash at the time. Yeah, Ron yeah. Washington at the field at like six yeah, I was into the field at six in the morning and yeah. you're on the half field at seven doing your drills. Yeah, he doesn't have to be there. This is voluntary. But I remember talking to Chad um, about what he thought about, you know, me offering some early work to some of our guys, and, and he really liked the idea. But, you know, obviously everything's changed. We bought that bus, and we always rent a field. Um, before our game, we always rent a field, and we take BP on the field. Our guys get tons of fungos. Outfielders sure. get lots of fly balls. And, our pitchers are on a schedule with our strength coach, depending on what day, if, they, if they're planning to throw the next day or they threw the day before or whatever. There's got 15 pitchers. But they're all I mean, not that's a professional just, environment. Yeah, they're all not just – we're trying to mimic that yeah. at the amateur level. Um, but, yeah, like you speak of the routine, it's – guys, you know, you're, you're attracting high-level players because they want to do the routine. They don't want to just show up and have some guy throw their name on a lineup card. Yeah. Um, but I agree. I mean, and that's anything in life. If you follow those routines and you believe in it and it gives you that, you know, your, your success and the success yeah. comes from those routines, it makes you feel better when you're struggling. Absolutely. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. And, and it helps get you back on track. And, Chad, you'd be – you know, I, I don't know if Jeff shared this with you, but that's what we're doing now with – a lot of our teams throughout the organization, not just, you know, not just our 17 year olds, but we're getting guys together to, to practice, to, to get loose. We're trying to give them in those routines. We're trying right. to give them trying. It goes back to, yeah. you know, like talking about when I was coaching you, I mean, we didn't even take pregame in and out. Like it was, it, it's just. No, it, was, it, it was, if you want to go to the cage, you take the bucket. Right. You go bang it up. Yeah, it's just that's what it was. I mean, it's and then you start looking at it and you're like, wait a minute, we got some really good players coming through this program. Like, we need to service these guys better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and and it's not you know on, on you know the the teams that don't have access to the bus. It's not um, it's not 
Well, right it, it's very normal. It's very normal to show up two and a half hours before the game so that your guys can get extra swings so they can work through something or, or whatever the case may be. I mean, it's not, um, you know, with, with our teams now, you know, it's not go take the bucket and go hit. You have coaches that throw BP. And yeah. a lot of the organizations, you know, we were playing in the – I coached 14 and under last year. And, you know, one of the teams we were playing in the Final Four against, you know, we were the only team – uh, us, well, us and one other team were the only two teams that were throwing BP to to their kids. Everybody else was like, "Here, go take the bucket, and go hit." Mm-hmm. And you know, I think it. I think what we found is that it does leave a lot of development on the table that we want to make sure we want to give to our kids. Yeah, you're maximizing. Your time's yeah. coming, buddy. When you got that little boy coming through, and you're right. watching some of the crap that goes on. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take my lawn chair and just sit out in the outfield. <laughs> no, you won't. You will not. No you way. Won't. No way. Uh, no, I, no. Just to go on a little light note here, the, the grab a bucket um, makes me think about the time. So, you know, in Carrie, like how the, um, the, the cages are like kind of like they were on the top of the hill and you had to go down this hill to go down to where yeah. the fields are? Yeah, I remember that. When uh, do you remember the story where me and Rob were the last two at the cage and we got left? And the baseballs and got they, they went. What yeah? What happened with how that? many baseballs can fit in a big bucket? You think like a, like five dozen? It was one of those big ones. So, one those so there was two. Ones. So yeah, we both had a bucket and we both put it in the back of your SUV. I'm pretty sure. And uh, you you had to go down for like because we were getting close to game time and you had to go down and like meet for the meeting or something. So me and Rob pick up all the balls, and we take the two buckets, and we put them in the back of the SUV. And uh, we both get in the car, and we're, we're running late. So I'm like, I bang it. I floor it. I'm like, God, we got to get to the game. And all of a sudden, we both look at each other. I hit the brakes, and all we see is hundreds of baseballs rolling down the hill, just <laughs> flying down the hill. Like, and I'm like, did you – and he's like, did you not? And we both forgot to shut the back, and I when I hit it, the balls flew out the back, and there were all hundreds of baseballs flying down the hill. And we both are hysterically laughing. Like, we ended up showing up late, a little late to the game. Like, there was balls everywhere. Like, we're sprinting down the hill trying to get ball, the That was a fall ball game at the USA Baseball Complex. And that's probably one of the other reasons why we got the bus. <laughs> so yeah. we didn't have to deal with that with you and Rob. Uh, that's a good uh, story. There's a lot of that we might I not. think I had to catch that day, and I wore probably like five or six absolute banger spinners from Mike. Was it? Yeah, Mike Kent. Or, Mike yeah. Kent, yeah. Yeah. We played the dirt oh. bags that game. Was that? I think we played the dirt bags that game. Did we? Well, I was wearing balls behind the plate. McBroom was at first base, and I remember I was trying to get some colleges in there. He was like the only one on the team that wasn't committed at the time. Which is also mind blown. Another great story, right? Yeah. He, I remember that day, and then you were, yeah, you were catching right, and then you uh, weren't there to warm up the pitcher. Yeah, because I was and picking up balls. We had to make some. Uh, <laughs> we tried to catch and thing because some of the. Why were we doing that? I, I, we just. I think we were short of catcher. I caught another time. It. I think I caught it. Carolina was second. interested in seeing you catch, Link Jarrett. Yeah, because they didn't want to see me in the infield. Yeah, you weren't good. I give him actually every time. Almost, he actually told me a couple of years ago. He's like, "Dude, you got to stop throwing that in my face." Oh my like, I, I bring it up. Please stop to watching I, today. Like, I loved it there. Remember that time you didn't want like Chad Pender wasn't good enough to come to East Carolina. Man, and, uh, yeah, that's. I true. tell people that all the time. I tell them like I loved East Carolina. Like you loved it. Go there. I would have went there. Yeah. He was there at – he came to a tournament. We were playing in Lynchburg at Liberty. I was committed at East Carolina, I think, if they had offered me when they took us on that walk around. Right. Well, he came to Lynchburg to watch you play in the fall of your junior year. I stunk, though. Well. I stunk. You know, who, you know who let me know about that was Covington. Oh, he, he's never afraid to, 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 to lay, it, lay it out there, huh? Yeah, he let me know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what the, the neat thing is is, is – and I think our players can take away from this is that, you know, some doors may close like that, you know, and and, and you were interested in, in, you know, to to put a relationship analogy in there, you were interested to get married before you even dated, right? 
you, you were you had been happy to to commit there, um, but it always doesn't work out like we want it to. No, the school it doesn't. I want to go to, I want to go to ECU. I love it. Everything I love everything about it, and then you find the right fit. Exactly, and for that I'm, super, I'm thankful super, to them for that. You know, like right, right, right. See, like, my how, where my path could have went. You know, I don't even. No one knows. Like it could have been right. a totally different career. It could have been. And that's what we said earlier. Like the first thing I said was Virginia Tech ended up being the perfect place for me and ended up being an awesome fit. And yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's really cool, really cool to see that. And, you know, you, you uh, again, back to your minor league career, I mean, t- uh, Texas League uh, Player of the Year in 2015 had a really good year. And then, uh, then you make your debut that following year. Tell, tell us about the, uh, your times in the big leagues. I mean, you um, you know you put up double digit home runs every year, um, and you talk about your routine. Now, now the interesting part of that is that I and the question I want to ask around your routine is how the heck do you know what your routine is given that you played every position except for catcher and pitcher? Yeah, um, so I, I've just I've learned it. I just over time like what I need to do, um, and now I, the the older I get. The, I feel like the more it's predicated on how my body's feeling. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not 21 years old anymore, and I feel like I can go take 500 ground balls without feeling it, you know. Um, you know, my routine, I, I didn't really truly understand the routine until I got into uh, high A, and I got to play with Daniel Robertson, who ironically is two years younger than me. He's not even 21 years old in high A, and I'm watching this kid go about his business, and I'm like, okay, that's a different type of preparation. Like, I, I don't do that. I, I need to do that. Like, that's – this guy is ready every single game. Like, he has – he does the same thing every single day, and the guy shows up every night to play. And um, so I started watching how he took his ground balls and, like, what he's – you know, he would take, you know, five at him, five to his left, five to his right, five to – that's all to first base. Five at him, five to his left, five to his right, all to second base, turning double plays. And he'd take his BP, he'd do his cage work. He, I mean, how he would, you know, operate in the weight room, um, just how he went about his business. And, you know, that was an eye opener for me. Um, and that's when I started to realize, like, all right, I got I to gotta get my own routine. You take away bits and pieces from everybody's routines, whatever, you know, works for you. Um, and then, like you said, you know, I get to the big leagues. And then one day they're like, well, can you play outfield? You know, Marcus is coming off the DL. Like, we'd like you to stay. And, you know, but there's no, pretty much nowhere in the infield for you. So I'm like, yeah, I'll play wherever. So go in the outfield, and the biggest thing for me in the outfield, it, you can do all you want drill-wise, but the only way you're going to get better in the outfield is getting reads off the bat during BP. Um, that, that, for me, is the biggest thing. So on days that I'm playing the outfield, I'll take, I'll take my reads in the outfield. I'll con- just treat that like a normal outfielder day. Um, days that I'm not playing at all, I'll do both. I'll take some reads, keep the light in the outfield, and I'll really get my infield work in. Um, if I'm playing the infield, strictly infield, and, like, I really, really fo- try to focus on my early work, um, excuse me, um, when, it, it, when it is the infield because I've gotten to the point in my career where I'm very comfortable in the outfield. Um, but playing sporadically in the infield at that level, it's tough. So you really got to stay sharp especially when you're not doing it every day and getting certain reads off the bat. Um, you know, you try to get as, as many reps as you can that day without, you know, burning yourself out for the game. Yeah, and I think, I think that routine really lends to, you know, and, and, and the ability to play all of those positions lends to your likability. I mean, you're, you're like the guy as it is, but I think, you know, a lot of the fans can relate to you um, because they see you always in the lineup and moving around and doing a lot of different things. Um, how, how is it with the fans in Oakland? How, how do you like it out there? And, uh, and what are some of the, the highlights that, that, that you have in the, in the area out there? You know, I, I love it there. Um, you know, the fans that we have um, are as, as good as they come. You know, I see fans that are – they're every day in Oakland, and the next thing you know, we're in Tampa. I see them in Tampa. I see them in Texas. I mean, they travel well. Um, you know, they love their team. Um, I think one of the cooler moments for me was, um, I don't know, if, I think it was my 
it wasn't when I first got called up in 16. I think it was in 17 when I got called up and I started playing, playing pretty well, going out to the field for the game and looking out and, you know, the right field crew had made a poster of my name and um, saying Pinder Power. And that was something my grandmother always said to me, you know, before she passed away. So seeing that was really cool. Um, you know, we, and we, like I said, we just have really loyal fans, you know, the same, fan, fa same faces that are there, they're there every single day. Um, get to know them. Um, you know, they're good people. It seems like I have never been to Oakland crazy. I've been to San Francisco three or four times. I need to get out there and, and catch a game, well, you know, here soon. But it seems like they're so, so loyal. Like I was – I loved Oakland. I loved Oakland when I was a kid back in the Conseco and <laughs> – um, McGuire days, Ricky Henderson. Yeah. Uh, just seems like people really love their baseball there for sure. They do. They do. Yeah. And I'll say this. Um, it's impressive the, that you're playing infield in the big leagues at the level you play it, and you can't focus all your time to it. How you just were talking about how you, know, you spend so much time out in the outfield. Just the fact that you're so efficient at both. And really, there's other guys. No one really has to do the routine you're doing. They can focus on their craft. Yeah, that one thing. Yeah, the outfielders yeah. are just focusing on hitting. You know, the infielders to get their infield stuff. Like, and, and there's so much that goes on behind the scenes. I mean, it speaks to what kind of athlete you are to be able to do that. It's, it's unbelievable. It's 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 weird how it's all happened. Again, it's one of those things you're just. There's no expectations. You just go in and you're just having fun. At that point in my career, I was just like, hey, I'm going to stay. I'll play wherever. And then now looking back four years ago, I'm like, oh, well, I enjoy outfield better now. Like I, like I played infield my whole life, and I'm like, I love playing outfield. Like I have a blast out there. And um, I don't know if that's just because, you know, now when I play the infield, I don't, I'm not as sharp as I usually am. You know, you, you try to like – you know, be sufficient. You just try to be sufficient. You make the routine plays at each place, and then that's really all you got to do. And then when you make the good ones, then that's just icing on top, you know? You talk about it being so – like this easy thing. It's impressive. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. But <laughs> Yeah, going impressive. Yeah, especially when you have a, a, a grown man that's, that's hammering balls at you, you know, third base, you know, a, different than – you know, playing in the middle of the field, you know, and, and, and then being able to move out to the outfield to be different. You know, you, you said it, that you've got to continually stay sharp. You know, you go have a run of playing the outfield and they, they write your name in the lineup in the infield. You know, you've got to there's, – there's a big difference between both yeah. of those. And then adding in the major league speed and the strength, you know, from that, that you're facing. And yeah, that, that's, that's – it really is impressive. Um, you know, we've had several kids that, um, you know, I, I, and I guess a lot of teams have saying, hey, my son is a shortstop or my son is a second baseman or my son is only a center fielder. He can't play left or right. Um, what what would you say to that? I mean, what, 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 what kind of advice would you give those parents and those oh, players? Man. There would be a whole lot of advice. <laughs> um, I would probably say you don't know. <laughs> Um, if your son can play shortstop, he can play any position on the diamond, number one. Um, number two, um, you know, guys that play other positions on the diamond at the highest level were once shortstops. That's what I would say, too. I would say, um, you know, why wouldn't you want the avenue to go in multiple directions um, to be available for your team to have more playing time. You know, I show up to Virginia Tech as a shortstop, and I got Tim Smallings in front of me. I got uh, Johnny Morales in front of me. I'm not sniffing shortstop. I got to figure it out. I got to play somewhere else. I, hey, can you go in the outfield? I was like, sure, I'll go in the outfield. You know, play a couple games out there. I'll be in the lineup, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll do anything to, do to get in the like, lineup. You're daggone right, yeah. Exactly. So, you know – if for someone to say my son plays shortstop, he can't play the outfield, I would say that couldn't be more false. Um, so, yeah, obviously me as a utility player, I, I preach, you know, you play anywhere, play anywhere, give you an opportunity, give you an opportunity. Um, and you never know until you try those positions. And there's 
absolutely nothing wrong with giving each position a try and giving it a go. So um, I would tell, and you look at the trends, look at the trends of MLB now, look at the trends in the minor leagues. They are pushing this versatility in every organization. Every organization now wants somebody that can play multiple positions and they want guys that can do it from the left side and they want guys that can do it from the right side. They want two guys on their roster that can play every position from the left and then from the right. So, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and, and, and those guys, you know, the, the funny thing, Chad, is those guys typically don't stay with us very long. You know, my, my son's a shortstop. He's only a shortstop. You know, those guys tend, again, they're, they're, they're more transactional. What can you do for me right now? Um, they're not the relationship. And they don't trust the advice that they're getting from coaches like Jeff and me and, and, and all throughout our organization that, you know, having that versatility is just going to serve you better when you're, you know, trying to make a high school roster, when you're trying to make a college roster. And you're, you know, some scouts are going to think you're beautiful, just like some coaches did. Some coaches thought you were a, you know, you were phenomenal. And then there were other coaches that said, eh, he's not my cup of tea. Yeah. And that happens saw, through all, all the layers. No doubt. I mean, I saw this quote the other day. I know we're kind of getting off topic. No, this is great. This Someone is put out there, it was not that long ago, uh, the base, the game will go on without you. So it's like, we oh, don't sure. need to give into that. So it's like, we have advisors, right, that pump us players and they trust us over the course of the 10 years or what have you, they've been giving us their prospects and they know what they're going to get and they're okay with it. And then you have the occasional advisor that says, well, I need this kid to play shortstop every inning or whatever. That's it's not, it's not yeah. going to work. It's not going to work. And they'll find somewhere for that kid to go play, but it's and that's not going to work. And, that's oh, fine. Fine. and he, he may be, he may be a shortstop only. He may be a guy that does it, but the chances are slim. Like well, just, my, mind's, my mind's changed 14 years ago, 13 years ago, whenever you were with us, uh, we had a kid by the name of Connor Naren in our yep. program. He was a stop only. His dad was a manager uh, with the Cincinnati Reds. You're not putting that kid at second. You're not putting him at third. He's going to play shortstop. Good family. Great. Jerry's awesome. But we had Chad coming through. And, uh, of course, Chris wasn't that way. You know, put him at third, put him at second, put him at short, put him wherever. But he ends up leaving, going to another organization. And then, then Chad becomes our everyday shortstop. And Chad was a better fit for us, not just as a player, but just the mentality, if that makes sense. And Connor was a fine player. Uh, I'm not talking player. bad about him or anything like that. But it's uh, that, to speak into what you're talking about, it's just a better fit with – the kind of kid and family that's open to uh, being all over the place, being a team. Yeah, guy. And, and I think that's I something, think, go ahead, Jack. since I was a little kid, I mean, my dad has always said it doesn't matter where you play. He's like, if you hit, they are going to find a position for you and you're going to play. You're just going to play. If you what find do you say nowadays? Big facts? Fa <laughs> facts, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Preach. <laughs> Man, I can remember when I was a little kid, I can remember um, probably 10, probably 10, 11 years old, and I would always play up with my dad's travel team, and I would play shortstop, and there would be parents would come over and just bicker and moan and complain, and at the time, my parents called AAU always angry and upset because – Parents would just wear my dad out. They're like, why is Chad playing shortstop? Why can't my son play shortstop? And my dad would literally pull me out of games in the middle of the inning from shortstop and put the kid, their kid out there to play shortstop every error. Just, is he good now? Can we get him? Can we put him back out there? Like, and at the time, I don't, I'm not realizing what's happening, so I'm upset. I'm like – well, why am I not playing? And what did I do wrong? Like, why is he going to play shortstop? And looking back on it now, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. Like, it's like. It's awesome. Of course. Like, here, you want little Johnny to go play shortstop? We're going to throw him out there. Throw you're, him into the fire. You're serving up a great story. So this summer, um, it was two summers ago, I had a kid that was hitting like 210. And I think the first 30 games, he started 26 of them. 
And then he kind of lost his job and he was really complaining a lot. And his dad was complaining a lot. And I was down the right field line where our guys are getting warmed up. And I was talking to a college coach in the ACC about it. And he said, well, you know what our head coach does with those guys? He goes, he gets them in the games. He goes, but he puts them in the games when people throw their best guy, like when they bring a really like a stud out of the bullpen or something. Oh. You, you just you holler at that guy in like the sixth inning. He's sitting over there. He's not paying attention to the game. Hey, man, go grab a bat because you know he's going to strike out, <laughs> right, because he's facing some dude with plus stuff. Yeah. You, you, you set these guys up, and sadly to say, but sometimes you set those guys up, try to set them up for failure. Yeah. Because their I mean, attitude sucks so bad. Yeah. You know, and then the guys that have good attitudes and are team guys – you try to set them up. You want a reward, yeah. You want. Yeah, I mean, that's just the fact of life. Way. It's sad that it's that way, but a good attitude towards well, the Yeah, I mean, a good attitude brings in, you know, positivity. Somebody wants positive things to happen to you. If, if those know? parents would have been a little more positive about the situation, your dad might have, you know, yeah. it would have been different. There's, one, there's a difference between you, a parent coming up and saying, hey, like, I know he's struggling, he's down, but, like, we got to keep him going. Like, you, you got to, like – What can we do to help him? Yeah. What can we do to right. get him back on track? It changes, like, right. it changes the whole thing, the, the way that it could have been handled. But that, them handling it that way with your dad is not good. And who knows? As crazy as it sounds, maybe some parent of an 11-year-old will watch this. And Well, and I, I think – 11-year-old coach who's given their time. Yeah, yeah I mean – Well, and I think it comes back to ownership, right? Um, you know, the way that that parent handled that with – um, with Chad's dad is, is you know what, it's your fault that, Chad, that Chad's at short and my kid isn't. Yeah. As the right way to do it, son. say, hey, what can I do to help my kid? Well, you know, can you stay, you know, can we have some extra BP? Can he take some extra ground balls? He really would like to play shortstop. What does he have to do to, to earn time there? And I think there's a huge difference and, and a big opportunity for parents to handle this much better. Like yeah, I mean, so emotional about it, and, and they do what that parent did, um, and and then the dad, yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I can't, I can't imagine, imagine like, off short. <laughs> if someone came to my dad, and, and I mean, you think about it, that's a humbling thing to do. That's to say, hey, like, I know my child is struggling, but what can we do? Like, I, I want him to continue to love the game. I want him to continue to play. Like, what can we do to help him be, be better? Like, I understand, you know, so-and-so is playing better and he's the right fit at this time, but how do we keep my son motivated to want to play the game instead of just having him sit here the, the entire time? And then when his at-bats are, you know, they're against Randy Johnson, you know. Right. It's like, right. what opportunity can we give him to keep the passion going? What opportunity can we go, you know, to keep him from getting so down on himself he doesn't want to play anymore? Um, right. You know, there's a, there's a lot of ways you can, you can go about it and, and – um, all the while getting your child or, you know, whatever, um, better. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Jeff, if, you know, parents and, 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 you know, hopefully it's not a parent conversation when they're, when they're, you know, 17, you know, even at 14, we're telling our kids, you know, our 14 national kids, Hey, you're the one who has these conversations, but you know, for a player to have that conversation, there needs to be some ownership from that player of, Hey, I know I'm not running too well. You know, I know I'm hitting 210. Um, you know, I know I'm scuffling, you know, what do I have to do to get more ABs? What do I have to do to, to get out of this funk? You know, Jeff, those players that do that, how do they typically, you know, how does that typically go, you know, when, when, when they have that conversation with you? I mean, what's, what's your I mean, attitude? attitude is everything, you know, I mean, yeah. the, the, uh, we had a kid last summer that struggled as well, and he came back in the fall, and there was another kid who struggled who didn't. He left. Uh, wasn't happy with it at all. And then the other kid came back and worked his tail off in the summer, in August when we were off and had the best fall. Alex Urban was the kid's name. He's going to Clemson next year. Um, he had a tremendous fall. And he struggled this summer. And he'll be the first to tell you he struggled. And uh, that attitude that he had was just, it makes people want to pull for you. Yeah. It goes back to what Chad was just saying. It, exactly. Everyone around you wants to see you get through it. Yeah. Because your attitude's so good. Yeah, one hundred percent. Have a big leaguer on the on the screen and, and preach to that. It's it's cool. Well, you know, and it comes back too to Chad. Chad, and, and this has come full circle because you know you talked about that your your first year or two in pro ball was you know you're on the phone with your dad saying I don't know if this is for me. You know, not not looking for 
um, you know, not looking for someone to bail you out, but, you know, talking through things. And, and I think players have uh, always, you know, whether it's in high school, whether it's in college or whether you're, you know, it's in pro ball, you know, you come to that realization of, all right, either I'm going to push through this and I'm going to take ownership and I'm going to get better or, you know what, this just isn't for me and I need to hang it up. Yeah. Um, you know, fortunately for the A's and for you and, and all of, us that, that you represent, you know, you push through it in pro ball and you figured out, hey, I've got to get better. Um, you know, I think more kids need to stick it out through that adversity. Like you said, if, if you know deep and you believe that this is what you're supposed to do yeah. from a baseball standpoint, I, I think more people need to have that stick to itiveness or whatever you want to call yeah. it um, to get through that. And, and you did, and it's you know, it, it was a growth moment for you, right? I mean, that's, I mean, that's it, kind of it was, I mean, it was, in my opinion, more of a, uh, like a life moment. I mean, you know, a life growth moment. Um, yeah. And I think I'm, I know I'm very lucky because of the, you know, the support system that I have. And I mean, my dad having been through it and knowing the situation, not everybody is, has that available to them. Um, right but everybody does have a coach. Everyone does have a teammate um, that knows how hard the game is. I mean, this game is, I mean, Brutal. it is a ball buster. Like it is the hardest game in the world. I mean, it is so hard to play the game of baseball. Um, but that's why the people that are playing baseball do it because it is so challenging. There's the reward when there is success is it's like nothing else. Um, so I think, you know, having a support system, having teammates, coaches, anybody that you can rely on from your past that, that knows how hard the game is, that has been there in some way, shape or form, it doesn't matter. Everyone's struggled in this game, whether it's, you know, from T-ball to the big leagues, so, you know, people have been through it. So finding somebody that you can lean on and talk to, um, and sometimes, you know, teammates are the best one, you know, guys that, that are there in the fight with you at that time. Finding somebody that you can lean on and, and stay close with, um, it's big. Yeah, man. It, I'm, I mean, I've been taking notes through this whole thing, and there's so much here, Chad. You are absolutely awesome. I mean, I knew that before. Jeff and I, you know, Jeff and I both knew that before. That's the cool thing is we want to share you with everybody else because they don't know a lot of this about you because I know you're a very humble person. You're very, you know, you're very well grounded. And I think that's why a lot of people connect with you, but if they don't know you, they just see you as a player, um, you know, you're, you're a great player, but they don't know what's behind the curtain. That's really one of the big focuses of what we're doing is trying to get behind that curtain and, and show a little bit about you to our players, because I think there's plenty of kids that'll be able to relate to you. Plenty of, plenty of our players will be able to say, man, I, yeah, I, you know, I've had that moment where, you know, I walk into varsity, I didn't have any expectations and, and just, you know, it, it, to be able to connect with a guy who's there is really, really awesome. You know, and it's a person that, you know, you're a person that, that Jeff and I both think very, very highly of, you know, you're well thought of here in your community. Um, last question for me is what do you do outside of the game? So, you know, you were talking about how hard the game is. You know, what do you what kind of interest do you have outside of baseball other yeah. than your family and, and your uh your your wife well during the season no, i shouldn't say just during the season but during the season um i do play a lot of video games um you know, i play a ton of madden um not as much fortnite anymore but i do play a lot of madden um i love to golf not very good and, uh, man, I, just, I love just going and getting a beer with the boys, man. I love going out and having fun. I love uh, hitting up breweries. I love just going out and having a good time. Um, man, I just like being around my people. There's a lot of, lot of great conversations that happen there. And yeah. it's, you, care, you, just, you care genuinely about everything that you do. Like, you, you care about being a good friend. You care about being a, I know you care at the highest level, being a good husband, a good son, a good brother, yeah, a good baseball yeah. player. You just, you care, man. And that's, that's what makes you so well, great. And that's why you have so many of the same friends from, 
you know, from your Canes experience, your teammates and things like that. And I know, you know, every time I see in the media one of your, you know, one of your current teammates talking about you, it's always there's always a good story. Not transactional, like you say, Rob. Correct. Not transactional yeah. at all. And I think that's one of the reasons, you know, obviously outside of your talent, why you're so successful, um, not only as a player, but in life. Um, you know, and we are super, super happy for you. Um, you know, love having you as, as one of the representatives of, of the Canes. Um, we might actually, I think what would be a really fun episode is get you and Rob on together. Please, um, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love nothing more than that. Well, we might have some time to make that happen if this thing goes. We have plenty of time, and I'm available. I'm available. You'd probably make yourself available Game 7 of the World Series if it, if I call it <laughs> if it involved a, fate, like a, a Zoom with you guys and Rob, I'd make, I'd make some time. Oh. We will definitely have to make that happen because uh, I want to hear more about the story and the reaction from Jeff. Uh, after that, after that game, while you two were just sitting there oh, trying, well, Manafly was involved too. Morgie was involved. Manafly mentioned stories. it in his. A couple other stories where they got hey. in trouble. No, there's just yeah, there's there's. We'll, we'll leave it alone for now. <laughs> there's yeah. plenty, man. I'm telling you what, man. Good times. The well, see that, time. and that's what they're, really, they're that's really what the Canes have have been about is really being about family, great players, great people. Um, and, and you, cert you certainly check off all those boxes, man. Um, you know, I know you'd rather be playing baseball now, but we love getting this, you know, this, this goal. I mean, there's so many things in here that you said uh, organically that's really going to help our players. So thank you so much. Thanks. Um, thank you for your time. I know you got a pregnant wife that's, that's, that's there. And we had to run around for the last couple of days. She, she gave me the, the, she gave me the hour. I'm good. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, glad we could spend it together, man. You've been great. Um, you have, I'm sure after today, several more fans that are going to be, uh, going to be watching you out there in Oakland. And, um, you know, when, when you get back and they, they flip the lights on and, and you guys get to play, man, I hope you go after it like you have with everything else. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, no, I, I'm, I'm very appreciative. It's been awesome been refreshing yes it, yes it has so we'll we'll, we'll hook you in uh, and rob up and we'll, we'll get get everybody together Perfect. and have a good time but uh until then man take care of your family take, take care, care of yourself it. and uh thanks for everything all right thank thank you. You. all right buddy see you thank you so much for joining us today big shout out to chad for being with us if you enjoyed this episode like comment subscribe review and share give us a follow on social media at canecast show you can reach out to me personally on all social channels at Rob Younce or send me an email at robyounce at gmail.com. I welcome your feedback as we look to improve this show every time out. Until the next episode, stay safe, wash your hands, and when the coach is talking, be quiet, look him in the eyes, and pay attention to the message. Isn't that right, Chad? <laughs>